Trying to determine what actually ruined the game of Yu-Gi-Oh! is a fruitless effort. I love this game, but it's always been a mess. However, archetypes are often cited as what ruined the game just as frequently as every extra deck mechanic. While I can recognize that archetypes do create fairly linear deck building, as in there isn't much in the way of creative flair that you can add to your archetypal focused deck, I would also say that archetypes are integral for new players as it gives them the building blocks to learn how to build a deck. Instead of rummaging through an endless sea of generic cars to try to string together something other than here's all of the earth attribute monsters in my shoebox, Archetypes offer a defined strategy and playstyle, and a bundle of monster spells and traps that are generally easy to identify based on naming convention, which takes out a lot of the guesswork. Of course, I'm biased, because very few of the tens of decks that I play are not built around an archetype. But let's take a look at where archetypes really began to flourish and make names for themselves in my opinion. We're ranking every archetype that was available in GOAT format. Before we get into the ranking, let's establish the ground rules for how we're defining an archetype. An archetype needs to have three or more monsters that either share a name trait, for example, Elemental Heroes, Amazonas, Harpy, or be a group of three or more monsters that work together by mention of each other in effect text. I've decided on this rule to basically eliminate union monsters that only work with one specific monster and have no other support. A union monster and its pal is not an archetype. This also takes away groups of cards that work together because they share a specific trait, like Sanctuary in the Sky. An archetype also needs to have at least one spell or trap, preferably more, but will make some exceptions, that share and or mention the archetype's naming trait and or fusion monsters that incorporate the archetypal main deck monsters. I've opted for this rule so that no one can try to make an argument that a ritual monster and its accompanying ritual spell card are an archetype. And that also eliminates any spell or trap whose only function is to special summon a specific monster when a requirement is met. That should be everything that we need to take into consideration, but if unique circumstances arise, we'll cross those bridges when and if we get to them. Alright, let's freaking go. Amazonas. You know them, you love them, some of you want to be imprisoned by them. Made up of primarily level 4 earth warrior monsters, the archetype has 7 monsters and 3 back row. We're off to a good start. Being level 4 warriors gives them the obvious advantage of being rota targets, adding some very welcome consistency to the deck. Their one non-warrior monster in Amazonas Tiger offers a semi-reliable stall and protection option dependent on your build's ability to put multiple Amazoness monsters on board with Tiger. Aside from that, their battle-focused archetype with monster effects ranging from attack point and battle damage manipulation, as well as the ridiculous effect of Amazonas Chain Master ripping cards from your opponent's hand and adding them to yours. I have no idea how this card has never seen time on the ban list. Their in-theme back row, while serviceable, is a bit unremarkable, offering more attack manipulation but very little creativity outside of that. I'd say their best option comes in Dramatic Rescue, which can protect you more necessary resources in exchange for a weaker monster that doesn't need to be another Amazoness. In terms of outside support, we've already covered Reinforcement of the Army. Your best options include Command Knight, which grants some appreciated stat boosting, Marauding Captain, Cyberjar, Sangan, and Giant Rat, aiding in field presence, as well as the Warrior Returning Alive, which can make for good recovery in a pinch if you can't wait for a Call of the Haunted and or Premature Burial. In its own bubble, Amazoness suffer from needing more outside support to gain access to the heavy hitters of the format. Dark monsters like Sangen and Cyberjar are right in home in this deck, but the lack of a proper light monster hinders all use of something like Blackluster Soldier. Not to say that they can't utilize light monsters, as Magician of Faith and Ninja Grandmaster Sasuke are welcome additions, but they also take away from the focus of what the deck aims to do. Their lack of an actual boss monster in turn forces you to run these extra cards, taking away from the Amazoness playstyle. Overall, they are more than capable with what they do when they stick to what they do, and I can comfortably rank them at B tier. The next archetype I was going to cover was the Armed Dragons, but I'm going to cover level monsters as a whole. I'm doing this because every variation of level monsters has the exact same support. The level up spell card in whatever type specific and or attribute specific battle tutors they have access to, as well as Sangan to turbo out their lowest level to get the ball rolling. Some variations far outclass others. Case in point, Dark Mimic can't hold horses nuts in a duel. 
but I've decided to go with an average based on how I'd rank them all individually, which leads me to rank level monsters at a high C tier. Next up is Blue Eyes, and this one is interesting. First off, they have a completely useless card in this format with Blue Eyes Shining Dragon. Because Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon premiered long after the end of Gulp format, you could not play Blue Eyes Shining Dragon. Dragon monsters, at least generic ones, weren't nearly as much of the powerhouse as they're known today. Don't get me wrong, they had some alright support, but it was just alright. Starting with the namesake, Blue Eyes White Dragon. As much as it can become a big shiny brick at times, you'll want to run three copies with the various means you have of getting it to the field efficiently. Burst Stream of Destruction. Their only back row feels like a lot of wasted effort. Field clearing is cool, but you aren't able to capitalize on that in any respectable way. It sure does feel like a banned Regeki format kind of card, though. The Archetype's two other monsters bring in the ease of summoning for Blue Eyes itself. Kaiba Man can special summon from hand and as a low level warrior is easily searchable. Paladin of White Dragon can special summon from hand or deck and has the plethora of early ritual searching cards in Manju, Senju, and Sonic Bird. If you're ever so inclined to tribute summon your blue eyes, Kaiser Seahorse offers an easier means to do so. But if you're not willing to subject yourself to that like myself, Lord of D, in combination with Flute of Summoning Dragon gets the Kaiba stamp of approval. Therein lies the problem is that we're moving away from Blue Eyes Goat Format deck and moving into Kaiba Tier 1 Starter deck. The Blue Eyes archetype being all light has a benefit over Amazon Ness with half of the requirements for Chaos monsters covered and most of the dark attribute monsters that you could consider running in the deck cover the other half. And we're running into another problem. Instead of playing Blue Eyes, we're playing how few Blue Eyes cards can I play in my Chaos deck before I can no longer call it a Blue Eyes deck. That's pretty much the issue with every variant, is that it's another deck with some Blue Eyes cards in it. And at the risk of losing any Blue Eyes players that are subscribed to me, I'm ranking the archetype at a D tier. When it's played pure, it really isn't the worst thing in the world, but everyone's afraid to play it that way. What is the worst thing in the world is the Pyramid of Light deck. I'm reluctant to call this an archetype, but it basically checks all of the boxes, so I'm forced to rank it as such. It's awful. Your main focus is to get Pyramid of Light on the board as quickly as possible, which you have no means of efficiently doing outside of draw cards and waiting a turn, and in using those draw cards, you'd better hope to find something that can protect your pyramid as well as the Sphinx monsters associated with it. If not, you'll be losing that card quicker than you found it and be relegated to Tribute Summoning Andro or Talea. Both of the monsters are massive, so they aren't searchable. Thinning in the Great Sphinx is a joke. F tier, firm F tier. Next is my personal favorite, so I'm going to try not to show my bias for the deck. Toons, baby. Let's get the worst card out of the way. Toon World. The card that this deck literally lives by is terrible. You really need some form of protection for this card alongside it, be that Solemn Judgment or Solemn Judgment. However, Toons have absolutely no problem finding this card in multiples with access to three copies of Toon Table of Contents. If you don't need to grab a Toon World, two of your best search targets come in Toon Mermaid and Toon Mass Sorcerer, which are also accessible by the typical attribute-specific tutors. Toon's biggest dilemma comes from their summoning sickness. It's always the summoning sickness. But if you can stand long enough to get around that, the deck has access to easily special summon beaters and largely oppressive control effects. Battle traps are an auto-inclusion for the deck to help circumvent this. They do also have in-theme access to a battle trick in Toon Defense, a continuous trap which lets you avoid destruction of your Toon monsters. There are better options in that effort, but I do respect you for running it pure if you so choose. As an added benefit, Toon's best lineup makes for the perfect setup with Chaos Monsters, and at the end of the day, that's what GOAT format is all about, isn't it? Don't ever complain about modern formats being restrictive to what decks can be played. With all of that said, I would usually rank Toons at S+, but to show my level head, I'll rank them at a C tier. They're the definition of slow, but they can do some wacky stuff. Double D, or Different Dimension, is a fun one. An archetype focused on banishing cards and either interacting with those banished cards or granting devastating effects based on number of cards banished. And it's one that I always recommend to players old and new that want to jump into GOAT format. All of their monsters, except for Different Dimension Dragon, which is completely irrelevant to the deck, are searchable in some way, shape, or form. DD Warrior Lady, Assailant, and Survivor are searchable with Rhoda. Crazy Beast, Scout Plane, and Trainer are all searchable by their respective attribute searchers. Their back row is really what sets them apart from the rest in my mind because it presents an opportunity to run just the smaller monsters if you aim for a stall and banish focus in your build. DD Borderline prevents the battle phase with no spells in your graveyard, which can easily be maintained with cards like Soul Release for any that have found their way into the graveyard or Banisher of the Light to keep them from going there entirely. 
DD Designator, in combination with any card that lets you look at your opponent's hand, makes for even more powerful hand control by banishing cards in your opponent's hand, making it that much more difficult to recover. And on a raw Designator, you can banish a card of your choice from hand, which can then be recovered with either of the next two cards. Return from the different dimension and or dimension fusion allows plenty of recovery for the banished monsters that this deck puts out. I personally run Return over Fusion to benefit the most out of the banished cards. And while not the most optimal cards, Different Dimension Gate and Capsule offer some fun tricks to either get rid of any problematic monster or search any card. They're not the most optimal because they both rely on staying on the board to maintain the effects, which can at times be a troublesome task. But when they connect, these are fantastic additions that give DDs an edge over the majority of cards in the format. And for those reasons, I would rank different dimension at an A tier. Coming off of a really good deck, let's look at a really bad deck, Dark Magician. This deck is garbage. Another one that I'm not entirely sold on granting the title of Archetype, but once again, it checks all the boxes and I wish it didn't. So the deck almost entirely requires Dark Magician to be on the field, which is not the easiest thing in the world. And even if it was, why would you do that? The best use of that Dark Magician is to immediately get it off the field with their quick play spell, Dedication Through Light and Darkness, so you turbo out a Dark Magician of Chaos. The second best use of that Dark Magician is, again, getting it off the field with Knight's title to special summon Dark Magician Knight, which at least grants you a single card pop. Everything else is dookie. Dark Magic Attack is a joke because rarely will you actually use it to destroy more cards than you could with a single Break of the Magical Warrior or Mystical Space Typhoon. Thousand Knives is laughable in comparison to Exiled Force, Tribute to the Doomed, and or Maneater Bug, all cards that accomplish exactly what this card does with a fraction of the effort. Sage's Stone is useless because if you're playing Dark Magician Girl, I'm going to assume that you're not playing it because you're playing Dark Magician, you creep. And finally, Skilled Dark Magician, I'm more than willing to give a pass as a good beatstick monster with at least a semi-reliable effect that can summon the big man from anywhere, unless you're facing DD. F tier. Matter of fact, I'd put this deck in a tier below the Pyramid of Light if I could. The next archetype is Dark Scorpions, who basically were shafted with absolutely zero in theme support since their debut. Which is whack, because their array of control effects could pose quite the problem for your opponent in this format. The Dark Scorpions are made up of six monsters and two back row. Two of those monsters don't count because they suck, and their one trap card doesn't count because it double sucks. Of the cards that actually matter, they're all low-level Dark Warriors with low stats, meaning they can be searched and tutored by several means in Mystic Tomato, Sangin, and their very own Mine the Thorn, and of course, Rhoda. Their spell card, Mustering of the Dark Scorpions, grants swarming that most archetypes of this time would kill for, albeit extremely limited, but in no way should it be discounted. Among their monsters, as I've said, Mine offers more searching for the deck as well as graveyard recovery, Cliff offers back row destruction and or milling, Chick offers bouncing removal, and finally Don's Lug, the card needed to make their spell card live, offers hand ripping and or milling. Where this deck struggles is actually implementing those control effects. They all need to inflict battle damage to use one of their effects, but all have less than desirable stats to do so. This can be worked around with beefy equip cards like Mage Power, United We Stand, and Megamorph, but it makes them far more reliant on those cards than any deck would hope for. Those limitations lead me to rank Dark Scorpions at a C tier, being that they really are a middle of the pack type of deck. Elemental heroes are often debated on if they are actually included in GOAT format as some players don't consider the Lost Millennium set as part of the format. I say it's fair game, so let's rank it. To avoid sounding like a broken record, the early heroes are all low-level, low-stat warriors, so they have the same access to searchers as every other deck of the format that fits that criteria, but because of their varying attributes, they have more difficulty with using the attribute tutors, as they tend to clog up the deck more when you need to get to your main deck heroes that you don't want to be sitting on for an entire turn. Their one back row, the trap card Hero Signal, offers a good in-theme protection to help maintain your field presence if you find yourself sitting on a single hero for the turn. The deck shines best with its fusions, as is customary. In my opinion, Thunder Giant and Flame Wingman are among the best and most accessible fusion monsters of the format. Flame Wingman boasts some considerable effect damage on each attack, and Thunder Giant makes for easy removal on a discard. The goal ultimately becomes, how do I turbo out multiple copies of each fusion as quickly as possible and end the game? Fusion Sage makes grabbing your polymerization easy, and if you opt for playing unconventional cards in your deck, Fusion Gate in combination with either Dimension Fusion or Return from the Different Dimension makes putting out multiple hero fusions much easier. With all of that said though, it's Fusion Summon or Bust for this deck, and if you can't get your fusions quickly, you quickly find yourself on the losing side of the duel. 
Elemental Heroes, whether you consider them a part of the GOAT format or not, gets a C tier, bordering on a D. Exodia was so close to not making this list, but because of Exodia Necros and its included spell card, it's just barely snuck its way in. And the worst part is that Exodia Necros and Contract with Exodia won't even be discussed because they're an abomination that would never be played in an Exodia deck. You all know what we're going to talk about. Draw spells, draw spells, draw spells, Royal Magical Library. Granted, the Exodia OTK and FTK strategy wasn't anywhere near the hyper-consistent pest that it would evolve into, but there were already several tools at a player's disposable to make the alternate win con of incels come to fruition. As much as I hate this deck, it stomps a good portion of this list, so against my better judgment, I would rank the Exodia archetype at a B tier. Let's go back to one that I actually want to talk about, Gravekeepers. It doesn't have anything to do with their ranking, but Gravekeepers vs. DDs is easily one of the most exciting GOAT format duels I've ever played. A match that quickly becomes who can establish their advantage first and overpower the other. On the archetype itself, Gravekeepers are another control-oriented strategy whose primary goal is to get their field spell Necro Valley on the field. Necro Valley basically locks both players' graveyards and all of the cards in it and all hell breaks loose. The problem arises when you see that Gravekeepers don't exactly have in-theme ways of getting Necro Valley on board efficiently. Their only tool comes in an Owl of Luck, which if you're lucky enough to not have it destroyed by Noble Man of Crossout, this monster can either put Necro Valley on top of your deck or add another copy of Necro Valley if you have one in play at the time of activation. Other than that, terraforming is a must for this deck. When you get Necro Valley on board, Gravekeepers have absolutely disgusting cards to combo with it. Royal Tribute rips all monsters in both players' hands. Gravekeeper's Chief unlocks your graveyard from Necro Valley and special summons a Gravekeeper from Grave on Tribute Summon, including the monster tributed if it was a Gravekeeper. And Rite of Spirit is an unlimited Call of the Haunted for the deck which is unaffected by Necro Valley. Taking our focus away from the field spell that caused many veteran players pain and suffering, two of their best monsters are Gravekeeper's Guard and <laughs> Flippy Wall Monsters with Banger Effects. Guard spins a monster your opponent controls, and Wander special summons another Gravekeeper. The archetype's biggest drawback comes from their searchability being quite literally limited during this format, as Sangin is their best option. The spellcaster type really didn't have any in-theme searching capability, which this entire deck is made up of. While Mystic Tomato can grab any Gravekeeper excluding Chief, the last thing you want is to special summon your guard or watcher in attack position. So, it's less of an attractive option and a side deck inclusion, if included at all. But even with those drawbacks, Gravekeepers still have more than enough party tricks to turn the duel in their favor early on. So, I feel good with ranking them at an A tier, right beside DDs. And I can't recommend highly enough that you and a friend put these two decks together and face off. Another deck that I wish would have received some kind of support buff in future eras of the game is Monks. This archetype really has everything working against it. It has two monsters, technically three if you include Chusuke the Mouse Fighter, which I'm assuming has some kind of lore that I can't be bothered to read, so two monsters, one of which summons the bigger one and that's it. To give the pair some credit, Master Monk special summons itself by tributing Monk Fighter, so if you open with both, you have a guaranteed Master Monk on board. These two monsters are also rock monsters, which have the most painfully non-existent support of nearly every monster type during this time in the game. Just like every other archetype up until this point, they have access to the Earth Attribute Tutor and Sangan, but specifically for Monk Fighter only, which actually makes it a pain to use them. And that really doesn't make the deck any more worthy of being called an archetype, where the other decks for the most part had their own archetypal search and spam options, with the generic tutors and searchers being secondary options to buff. These secondary options are the only options for the deck, and when you expend your only targets for these searchers, they're all but useless to your deck. I would say that the archetype is battle oriented, but I'm hesitant to even call it that. Master Monk can attack twice, that's your win condition, and the back row doesn't do much in any effort to aid in that win condition. Kaminoti Blow ensures that your opponent's monsters get destroyed after they've destroyed your monk monsters. Fantastic. Legendary Black Belt inflicts effect damage when your monk monster destroys an opponent's monster, which is cute, I guess. And Lone Wolf protects Master Monk from monster effects and battle, which would be halfway decent if it didn't have to be the only monster you control and it protected from traps at the very least. You know, the thing that is often a death sentence for any battle-focused strategy? This deck just has nothing going for it, which I hate to say because the aesthetic of Master Monk is really cool. But this deck belongs in F tier. Even Dark Magician stomps the monk. Let's get a couple more bad ones out of the way. 
Guardians. If it weren't for Arsenal's summoner, they wouldn't have made the list. It's a barely competent searcher. The few means of getting to your necessary equip spells are terrible. Fairy of the Spring is too slow. Chopman the Desperate Outlaw and the Kickman are far too inconsistent for this deck to pull off, and Iron Blacksmith Kotetsu is all around their best option, but again, too slow even for this format. Did I mention they also have an unplayable monster? Yup, Butterfly and Dagger Alma was banned at this point, so Guardian Alma is unusable. Setting the monster doesn't count. The best monster they have access to is Guardian Grarl, who carries a special summon ability, but Guardian Grarl serves better in a generic dinosaur deck. Easy F tier. Red Eyes, to no one's surprise, is just Blue Eyes, but worse. Black Dragon's Chick is a less searchable Kaiba Man. Inferno Fire Blast is only marginally comparable to Burst Stream of Destruction. Red Eyes Black Metal Dragon shouldn't even be in the conversation, but it does force you to run Metal Morph, which as a standalone card is better than every Red Eyes during this time combined. And lastly, Red Eyes Darkness Dragon is about the only salvageable thing from this miserable set of cards, being an actually playable counterpart to Blue Eyes Shining Dragon. If you're going to run Red Eyes Goat Format build, it should be to turbo this card out as quickly as possible and stack the graveyard with dragons for ridiculous stat boosting with responses to battle traps ready to go for an OTK. Another strong F tier. Ninjas are a curious case because there are six by name ninjas that are available during Goat Format, which were clearly never intended to be utilized together, but the spell and trap support can be used with every single one of them. Fuma Shuriken, their sole equip spell, offers a respectable stat boost and burn damage upon destruction, akin to Black Pendant. Ninjutsu Art of Decoy can protect a ninja monster while on the field, and Transformation lets you swap into a non-ninja monster, for whatever reason. Armed Ninja, Crimson Ninja, and White Ninja are teeny tiny flip effect monsters that deal with spells, traps, and defense position cards respectively. Those effects will come up in every 100 or so duels with your Ninja Goat deck. Grandmaster Sasuke is still an overall good generic beat stick monster as with Strike Ninja, and Lady Ninja Ye, the monster that the trap cards were clearly intended to work with, has a fun one-sided giant trunate effect at the cost of discarding a win monster including a copy of itself. They suffer the same issues as elemental heroes, having too much diversity in their attributes which makes it hard to rely on attribute tutors, but they're all low level warriors. I would say each ninja monster has a home in a different deck that better suits them than their own dedicated deck. Strike Ninja works fairly well in different dimension, Dark Scorpion, and generic chaos builds. Grandmaster Sasuke is best in generic chaos, generic warrior, really any deck that could stand for a light level 4 beat stick, which is most. The flip effect ninjas are more of a novelty than a necessity, and Lady Ninja Ye actually fits right at home in a deck that we'll cover later in the list. So, on the merit that they aren't entirely useless and more so incompetent as a unit, I'll rank ninjas at B tier. Speaking of incompetent, how about Ojamas? Not that the deck is incompetent, because it goes kinda dummy, just the Ojama monsters themselves I imagine to be less than fully cognizant. We're back to cohesive attribute and typing among the members, those being Ojamas Black, Green, Jesus, and King. Low level light beast monsters. The main deck trio can be tutored with Shining Angel and or Rescue Cat. Ojama King makes for a pretty reliably made lockdown in combination with cards like Ground Collapse or even their in-theme Ojama Trio. And of course with a fusion focus, Fusion Sage is a must-have for this deck. Honestly, not a whole lot of bad you can say about this deck. It can be annoying and hard to deal with for some decks, even those that are typically far better than pure Ojama. And because of that, I'd rank the Ojama archetype at an A tier. Just a few archetypes left and going into Archfiends it seems like we might be going out with a Whimper. Widely varying stats on level 4 and lower fiend type monsters all with differing attributes. It's like we set out to make the most unsearchable deck possible. Their only consistent means of searching comes from their field spell, Pandemonium, so you better get it out as quickly as possible. The rest of their back row might as well be ignored for a completely generic spell and trap lineup for your deck. It focuses on all the wrong things and actively hinders you worse than it does your opponent. The only glimmer of hope in the monsters comes from nearly every one of them having some form of Omni Negate, or at least it would have been helpful if those Omni Negates were not tied to resolving a damn die roll properly. I was of the understanding that these monsters were based on the pieces of the game of chess. Why are we bringing in dice rolls? I want to slap Archfiends into the F tier with the other trash, but on the facet of the deck that at least having access to several Omni Negates, regardless of their inconsistency and their archetypal field spell being halfway decent, I'll kindly put them in D tier. 
Hopefully, you didn't forget Lady Ninja Ye, because we'll be looking at Harpy Lady next. Let's get the biggest detriment out of the way. With all of Harpy Lady monsters always being treated as Harpy Lady, you have 5 different monsters of which you can play 3 max, instead of what should be 15 available monsters. The base Harpy Lady choice tends to be split between Cyber Harpy Lady for the highest base attack or Harpy Lady 1 for better searchability and stat increase for all of your wind monsters. They also carry an in-theme battle searcher in Birdface and along with Flying Kamikiri No. 1 and Sangen, you have 7 options for tutoring. Regarding Lady Ninja Ye, along with Ninjutsu Art of Transformation, she can turn into your Harpy Lady of choice. While it is an option they have access to, it's not the most optimal with Transformation now needing to remain on the field. Elegant Egotist grants the deck better swarming options than most of the archetypes that we've covered. And finally, the shining stars of the show, the Field Spell, Harpy's Hunting Ground, and Triangle Ecstasy Spark. Hunting Ground gives Harpies access to multiple uses of MST in a format where said MST was limited. And Triangle Ecstasy Spark gives huge OTK potential to a deck otherwise filled with lackluster attack monsters. I think that Harpy Lady is deserving of our first ranking in S tier. The final archetype we have to rank is the original Xyz monsters, those being XYZ. An archetype of three level 4 light machine monsters, one being a normal beat stick in X head cannon, and two union monsters in Y dragon head and Z metal tank, both of which can equip themselves to X head cannon, granting an attack boost and one time protection from destruction. If you're feeling adventurous, you banish the corresponding pieces you control to access their four monster fusion lineup. Each carry a destruction effect at the cost of a discard, XY Dragon Cannon destroys face up back row, YZ Dragon Tank destroys face down monsters, and XZ Tank Cannon destroys face down back row, easily the most useful of these three. If you can banish all three pieces, you can play the big and bad XYZ Dragon Cannon, which at the cost of a discard can destroy any one card your opponent controls. Good effect, but a lot of effort going into this. As far as their generic support, Frontline Base lets you special summon one of your Union pieces, and if you already have X-Head Cannon on board, you've got quick access to the two-piece combinations. Shining Angel can also tutor out your Union monsters, but that's really it for your extending options. And once you've expended your resources on the Fusion, they have little recovery options outside of the Dimension Fusion and the Return from the Different Dimension. It's manageable with some heavy hitters, so I would rank the XYZ archetype at a very low B tier. But that is every archetype from GOAT format ranked. Drop a comment down below, how would you rank these archetypes yourself? Which are your favorite archetypes from GOAT format? Let me know down below. If you liked the video, don't forget to drop a big thumbs up. It's greatly appreciated, as always guys. And until next time, this has been Purple Pineapple TV. Signing off.